Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In uh, today's video, I'm going to continue the series on Martin Buber's uh, I and Thou. Um, and I'm going, he doesn't really break it into chapters, it's broken into uh, like fragments or small sections. Um, so I'm going through the analysis and, uh, and doing um, my regular sort of philosophical interpretation of the reading. It's pretty in depth. Um, today's reading is going to be a continuation on um, some of the some of the, uh, the the concepts that were discussed in the last six videos. Um, as a, a quick aside, um, Buber's read um, is very poetic, right? He writes in a very poetic language, um, and it makes for a great read. Um, it also makes for a very very intensely difficult read, and not difficult in a bad sense. I mean, as a philosopher, I sort of have an affinity for things that are difficult um, to interpret. Um, I've read Buber uh, in the past, and I've incorporated uh, Buber moderately in the work that I do um, outside of sort of YouTube, but in preparing for these lectures and going back and reading Buber and sort of, because you read it in a different sense when you're reading it for, for lecture than when you're reading it just for your own understanding. When I'm reading a work uh, with the intent of presenting the information to everybody in the world, I have to be very, very rigorous. I'm a lot more rigorous in, in my read. I'm a lot more critical in my read. And it was, it was actually in today, a couple hours before actually making the video now, and my preparation for the uh, the, the videos and writing up the notes and conceptualizing and trying to make sense of what he said, I came to understand that, there, you know, my first read years ago of Buber um, is drastically different from my read, my interpretation that I have of Buber now. So I'm a bit conflictual my, my, uh, in, in reading, and I'm very interested, right? you know, this hasn't happened to me yet. I've, I've done presentations on a lot of philosophers, and I, I basically have the same interpretations now that I had then. In reading Buber now and returning to his text now, I'm finding that my interpretations originally have drastically changed, and I'm sort of working through that as I'm presenting the information. And I, and I decided to to uh, to present sort of this this change in interpretation that I've had uh, on my initial reading of Buber and now my current reading of Buber, um, because I think it'll be good to sort of see the evolution of. Uh, an individual's interpretation of uh, a text. So enough of that. With that being said, I'm going to uh, begin uh, this next section on uh, Martin Buber. I've created sections arbitrarily. There are no sections in the uh, in the um, in the book. The last section was section one, and I think that was videos one through six. This video seven through whatever it takes, wh whenever this series ends, will be classified as section two. So this is. Uh, section 2 of Martin Buber's I Thou. This is section. Alright, so this is section 2 of Buber's I Thou, and as I said, uh, I've assigned the, the section breaks, uh, not arbitrarily, as a purpose, but I've assigned it so that I can keep pace myself and where I left off the last time and where I need to go and blah blah blah. Okay, so um, you know, I, I do a lot of creative writing uh, and I read a lot of creative literature. I, I have a fascination for creative writing. And now that I'm thinking about it, um, uh, in reading in reading Buber, I, I, and I apologize if I seem off, because I am off, but my, my brain is in a different space right now. Because um, it's not necessarily, Buber doesn't write in the regular sort of regimented philosophical logistic, uh, uh, logistical structure. The structure that I like to read and the structure that I like to write. I like to write, like, you know, if this happens, if this happens, then this happens, therefore this happens. Very boring to read, but I can follow very, very dense argument easily if it has a structure. I'm not saying that Buber doesn't have a structure, but when I was reading him and in my presentation, it's going to be a little bit outside of my traditional comfort zone um, because he is so poetic, he is so creative. Um, and obviously the, the, the inspiration and the source of his text, this concept of the Tao, is a spiritual, it is spiritual, right? He, he is, it's, it, would be, it would be 
um, tragic to discuss Buber without recognizing that all of this takes place within a very, very philosophically spiritual discourse, right? You cannot do an analysis of I and Thou without acknowledging that um, the spirituality and, spir uh, 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 and, and religion, I don't want to use the word religion per se, but spirituality um, heavily informs the discourse, right? I mean, he talks about prayer uh, in, in the section that we're going to discuss. So, um, in this lecture, and then I'm going to start writing on the board soon, but, you know, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued a bit by what I've read today, um, because it's the first time I've read it in, in, in years, but um, I have uh, a, an affinity for, I think he was a sociologist, uh, Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces, I think the name of the book is, I have it somewhere in the office, but um, I love that book, right, um, and, I, and I use his book to help me in my own fiction writing. Uh, and, and, and I know he, Joseph Campbell, informed um, uh, uh, George Lucas in his narrative uh, on the Star Wars, you know, the Star Wars series. Um, and I was watching something from Joseph Campbell once, um, and it was an analysis of aesthetics, right, aesthetics. And I realize now that um, my my YouTube page, if you were to look at my YouTube page and um, see, well, my YouTube page is um, somewhat of a reflection of me academically. It's a pretty good reflection of who I am academically. But if you look at the YouTube page, it's a lot of logic, it's a lot of math, it's a lot of rigorous philosophical thought. I had a bit on ethics, just a bit, a blurb on ethics, but I recognize in reading Buber that I haven't done aesthetics at all. I haven't done any aesthetics. So I apologize for not having done any aesthetics. You know, in reading Buber, you recognize that he is really steeped in the tradition. He doesn't say this, no one says this per se, but I recognize this of, you know, as a philosopher that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, suggestions towards aesthetics. So what I'm going to do next year in January, sometime in January, is um, to do, uh, I want to do a pretty in-depth uh, series in aesthetics because it would be wrong to think that philosophy is just math and logic, right? I love that part of philosophy. It made me uh, and it equipped me with the ability to decipher very dense text. Um, but aesthetics and aesthetic appreciation have an equally important role. Um, for me personally, um, um, spirituality uh, and spiritual relation not necessarily religious belief, but spiritual relation uh, has a very important role. And Buber, he's sort of he's he's tapping into this. So when I'm reading it, I'm I'm going through, I'm going through a lot of this in my head as well. And I think hopefully, if I do this lecture right today, you'll be able to have the same effect that I had in reading Buber um, today. So.